In this study, we will finish our, our look at the Psalms, and we're starting with Book 4 of 5. And Psalm 90 here is was written by Moses, and David wrote 101 and 103, but the rest are anonymous. The themes are the fleeting nature of life and God's future earthly kingdom and the proper attitude and actions of his subjects, as well as his power as creator. Psalm 90 uses that creative power of God to remind us of our place and our need for both humility and gratitude. <clears throat> Verse 4 might be what uh, 2 Peter 3, 8 was drawn from, though it's in the context of patience there as opposed to here, where our very short lives can't be compared to God's timelessness. The phrase about the length of our lives in verse 10 is taken by many as a prophetic statement, but um, as a limiter, I, I guess I should say more specifically, in reference to what Jesus said in Matthew 24, 34. But the context here is that not only are our lives short, they're also filled with struggle. So now we'll go down to Psalm 91, and it has the familiar theme of God as our refuge. But notice also that in verses 10 and 11, let's scroll down to those, are what Satan quoted when he tempted Jesus in the wilderness in Matthew 4, 6. Jesus quoted Deuteronomy 6, 16 in response, and some take it as that he was calling himself God, which of course he is. But what he was actually saying is that if he had done what Satan tempted him to do, Jesus himself would have been testing God. So the lesson for us is that we too must not test God, even by citing scripture, as Satan did. The popular habit known as name it and claim it is one way people test God today. Also, Jesus referenced verse 13 when he set out the disciples in Luke 9, uh, 10, 19. <clears throat> and then Psalm 92 praises God for his character of love and faithfulness to the righteous, but also his judgments against the wicked. Psalm 93 is another royal psalm and is focused on both the earthly king of Israel and God as the ultimate undefeatable king who is over all. And then 94 exalts God as the great avenger who is certain to punish those who think that his patience means he turns a blind eye to their evil. Psalm 95 is another royal psalm with more lessons from history. Verses 10 and 11 are quoted in Hebrews 3 and 4, that's chapter 3 and 4, which points to the literal nation of Israel being denied entry to the promised land as a lesson for people today, who by the rejection of Jesus will be denied eternal rest. And then Psalm 96 continues to focus on God as king and that all the nations should honor him. This had been Israel's mission to represent the one true God to the nations so they would want to abandon their false gods. But like many Christians today and churches in general, Israel largely failed in that mission. This is not to say all churches are failures. It's just to say that it, it's not done the best job of representing God to the nations in the world. Then Psalm 97 stays with the royal theme, but focuses more on the yet future time when God will finally establish his kingdom on earth. This is more obvious in the Greek Old Testament, which has verse 1 as the Lord became king, where the Lord came to reign. God has, of course, been king in eternity past, so anything that happens at a point in time is not from eternity past. <clears throat> so this is also seen in uh, Philippians 2, 5 to 11, uh, in the early chapters, especially of Hebrews, and in John 1, 1 that Jesus being God is true from eternity past, but he took on human nature at a point in time, and that's when he became the son, as the scripture puts it, uh, I have, uh, you are my son today, I have become your father. So it could not be something that was true in eternity past. And then Psalm 98 is yet another royal psalm of praise for respect for Israel's God from among, from the nations praising him, and 99 is another reminder of how the nations came to know him. This is by what they saw him uh, do for Israel as they left Egypt and traveled through eventually to the Promised Land. Psalm 100 is one of the most familiar and memorized of the Psalms, along with the 23rd, and it's both short and a happy psalm. So that's 
one of the main reasons it's chosen for especially children to memorize. Notice that we should worship with joy, not always the somberness that many associate with being in God's presence. You will find even today many uh, more formal worship services where only uh, it's seemingly somber hymns are sung. <clears throat> Psalm 101 is another of David's songs where he pledges loyalty to God by living a holy life. This is also echoed in Romans um, 12, 1 and 2, I believe, where um, God says, this is your spiritual worship. So live the life and don't be conformed to the world. And it reminds us here as Christians that reading out, reaching out to a lost world doesn't mean sinking to its level. David's standards were much higher than that of many Christians. It's possible that this psalm extended beyond the historical kingdom ruled by David to the future kingdom of God. But um, the point, the main point I think for us here is that we can't reach the world by becoming like the world. In it but not of it is not just a phrase, it's something we have, it's a balance we have to find. And then Psalm 102 is a lament and a confession and a plea for deliverance. Psalm 103, and that 102 goes on for a while, Psalm 103 is a praise song, and once again we should remember that the promises to deliver, forgive, and heal are not always realized in this life. The section beginning in verse 10 is a familiar description of God's forgiveness, mercy, and love because God remembers that we're lowly clay pots that only last a short while. <clears throat> and then 104 continues by describing God in regal terms and that he is the creator above all. Notice the descriptions of how the world was made, though. Stretching out the skies like a tent curtain, laying the beams on clouds, setting the earth on foundations that will never move, and so on. Most take this all poetically, but nowhere in the Bible is the earth described as moving or spinning. You could say it's an argument from silence, but the fact remains that the Bible never, even poetically, describes it in such terms. This realm was made for us, so it seems reasonable to conclude that it is the heavens that move around us, rather than the earth worshiping the sun, so to speak. If you recall Genesis 1, it says that the heavenly bodies serve to not only light the earth, but also to tell us of hours, days, and appointed times. So we might ask ourselves, was the clock made for people, or were people made for the clock? Think about why God made the heavens, and what purpose they serve, and the centrality of the earth and the people living on it in the Bible. And ask yourself whether this, the uh, modern theories of us doing all the spinning and moving, well, that everything spins and moves according to them, but of us being an insignificant spinning ball in space is actually science or a story that makes us insignificant and God unnecessary, just as the entire theory of evolution does. Just something to consider. Now, Psalm 105, which goes quite a while to go through 104. 105 is a long praise to God for his faithfulness to Israel which is named in verse 6 as Jacob. Remember, Jacob's name was changed by God to Israel, which means he struggles with God. And as stated in 1 Corinthians 10, 6, and 11, we should learn lessons from the history of the nation of Israel. That's why they're there. And then we go down to 106, which is the final uh, psalm in book 4. And it's another reminder to learn these lessons. One of the most important lessons are the dangers of compromise and appeasement and longing for the world instead of for God. So if we get nothing more out of that, then we should at least get that lesson. Okay, now to book five, which starts with 107. Scroll down to that. <clears throat> the Psalms of this book were written by mostly, um, I'm gonna say mostly, but a lot of them by David. And 127 was written by Solomon, but the rest are anonymous. The overall character is praised for what God has done and will do. So 107 is a reminder to not keep silent when God has answered prayer and that suffering should result in us becoming humble. 108 
He is believed to be drawn from various other psalms, like they were pieced together as kind of a um, refrain or, or reminder or summary. And it focuses, of course, on the nation of Israel. And then 109 <clears throat> is a lament and a plea for vengeance, again, which should be a last resort rather than a first one. God delays his punishments, and so should we. But as Jesus said in Matthew 7, 2, God will judge everyone according to how they judge others. So be careful to remember the golden rule, which we, you can find in Matthew 7, 12. So look to Matthew 7 for how and when God judges or delays judging, and that he will judge us according to the way we judged everyone else in this life. So if we were harsh with them, God will not show us much slack at all. And if we were patient and forgiving, then that's what we'll get at the judgment. Psalm 110 begins with a very familiar section concerning the Messiah, one that Jesus quoted in Luke 20, 42, and it was also co co quoted elsewhere in Luke, Acts, and Hebrews. He was telling them that the Messiah could not be a mere human, and at the same time telling us of all the tr us all of the triune nature of God. Though the Hebrew text uses two different words translated Lord here, the Greek of both Testaments uses the same word for each. Both the original and the quote of it in the New Testament use theos for both of the instances of Lord, whereas the Hebrew has two different words, Yahweh and Adonai. As for footstool, it referred to the ancient practice of the conquering king putting his foot on the neck of the defeated king. Oops, I went there. Yeah, verse 4 is where we see the Messiah identified as an eternal priest in the order of Melchizedek. But before I go on to that, just to say again about putting uh, about the footstool, it's used metaphorically because the foot on the neck was like treating the conquered king as a footstool. So be careful to look in each context to see what is meant by that. Anyway, in verse 4, uh, Jesus is the Messiah specifically is shown to be in the order priestly order of Melchizedek, which is cited many times in Hebrews 5, through chapter 7. The original Melchizedek and David and Jesus have or will rule from the physical city of Jerusalem. Here again, there is prophecy yet remaining. And there's this tie between that priesthood of Melchizedek through the line of David to Jesus the Messiah. Now Psalm 111 is another acrostic poem, meaning, once again, that it follows in the order of the Hebrew alphabet which aided in memorization. That's why it was done. So a lot of things were force fit, but it was for memorizing. And again, what needs to be memorized is the history of God with Israel. So it isn't enough to memorize, but to know what it is you're supposed to remember and why. And then 112 continues that theme with emphasis on how we should live in light of that history. And 113 focuses on what God will do in the future if we learn those lessons. 114 is a reminder specifically of God's miracles in Egypt. And 115 includes a warning against worshiping idols. That's history of Egypt included as a subset of that, a, a warning against worshiping idols, as Israel had done even after seeing the miracles God performed to get them out of slavery. We need to try not to make the same mistakes. When we're delivered from something, we should learn to trust God and we have as much trouble with that as Israel seems to have done. And then 116 is another plea, um, plea for deliverance, or plays, praise that it happened, I should say. And 117 calls on all the nations to praise him, not just Israel. And 118 describes God once again as a strong fortress. And that brings us then to the longest acrostic psalm of all, 119. Even though that one's fairly long, this one is much longer which is all about the commands or really teachings of God. That's what Torah means is instruction. And so we shouldn't think of it so much as limited to specifically the laws of Moses, but rather any and all that is part of the word of God. We'll make brief observations about each section, which a section being uh, every line starting with that particular letter of the Hebrew alphabet and highlight the differences because there's gonna be a lot of repetition and so what we need to do is bring out what's different about each one. So for verses 1 through 8 is the first section. And 
these are about blessings for heeding God's instruction and seeking him out. And then 9 through 16 is about the importance of starting early in their life as possible to take God's teaching seriously. The next one is 17 through 24, and it highlights the importance of being teachable. The next is 25 to 32, which is about the sustaining power that this word of teaching provides. 33 through 40 is the next section, and it's a plea for wisdom to live that holy life, whereas 41 to 48 is back to a plea for deliverance. Then the next section, 49 through 56, is a plea for God to remember his promises, and then 57 to 64 is for God to remember our faithfulness so that he can keep those promises. And as if, again, God does not need to be reminded. He wants us to say these things and plead with him as we would plead with any honored parent or mentor. And then 65 through 72 is a plea for discernment and vindication. 73 to 80 is an acknowledgement of God as our powerful but merciful creator. 81 to 88 is another plea for deliverance. 89 to 96 is praise for the permanence of God's instructions and faithfulness. 97 to 104 is hunger and thirst for God's teachings, and we have to ask ourselves, do we have that today? If David could do this, why can't we? And if the people of Israel were expected to do this, how much more the people in the church, the body of Christ? We should have that same hunger and thirst for the word of God. And then 105 to 112 is about God's word as the lamp that illuminates our path in life. That's a familiar psalm. And then 113, or part of the psalm, I should say, 113 to 120 is an expression of loathing for those who despise God's instructions. It's not wise to do that. 121 to 128 is an appeal for God to remember when we suffer unjustly. And 129 to 136 is another comparison of God's words to light. 137 to 144 is about the justice and fairness of God's teachings, his word. 145 to 152 is a plea for deliverance from the God who isn't really far away. 153 to 160 is about the fate of those who reject God's teachings. 161 to 168 is about choosing suffering for God's honor over our own life. I see this all the time as a problem of Christians online who value their standing with unbelievers more than standing up for the honor of God because they believe mistakenly that being loving means being um, accepting of all false teachings and false teachers, whereas this is actually being unloving to God. Then 169 to 176 is an appeal for God to hear and act. And Psalm 120 through 136 are all songs of ascent, called so because they were sung as the people of Israel traveled up to Zion, which was elevated, and they went up there for the annual feast. This one pleads with God for vindication and deliverance from liars. 121 looks to the hills around Mount Zion, and is often quoted as a parting blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you, etc. Psalm 122 expresses the joy people should have at the thought of being in the presence of God. Psalm 123 reminds us of our dependence on God, and 124 is praise from David for delivering Israel from all her enemies. 125 once again uses Zion as a symbol of God's protection and blessing. That does not mean that there will never be a literal Zion, or there never was. And 126 pra praises God for proving it true, that Zion is the symbol of God's protection, and God proves himself to be the protector over and over again. And then 127 is often quoted as a warning against forgetting God in our daily lives. But it also promises blessings for remembering God, though some twist verses 4 to 5 to mean Christians must have large families. It doesn't say that. Cherry-picking 
which ignores context, has given birth to many heresies and damaged many lives. People in such as those with ridiculously large families, because they believe that a, uh, a woman's purpose is simply to crank out babies until she can't anymore, this has destroyed many people. The whole patriarchal teaching, um, in the one case especially, the man was actually believed by his family to be God as far as they were concerned, and they were all to obey him as God. This is the there's, there's different names for that sort of thing, but um, there was a, a family on TV for a number of years that was notorious for this, and they downplayed what they believed, they, the way they treated uh, the man as God and the woman as basically an incubator and baby machine. Whether she approved of that or not, this is not what God is saying here. That's the point. So then we'll go on to 128, which praises God for his blessings, and 129 recalls the many times God delivered Israel. 130 is another cry for deliverance. 131 urges people to follow the examples of godly people as mentors. That's what we're supposed to do as Christians as well. That's what elders are supposed to be, examples. And then uh, 132 is where David expresses his frustration at being denied the honor of building a temple for God, as Solomon explained also in 1 Kings 5.3. David had shed too much blood, and so the actual building would go to his son, and David was really torn up about this. So that's what that psalm was about. 133 expresses the delight when people actually manage to get along. So... That was a problem. It's always been a problem, people getting along, and so it's really nice when it happens. And then 134 is about the temple priests praising God, <clears throat> and 135 extends out that call for praise from all the people beyond the priesthood, along with more lessons from Israel's history to justify such praise. 136 is a responsive hymn of praise between song leaders and congregation about the enduring love of God because it, you can see that it keeps repeating his love endorsed forever. That's kind of a, what we'd think of as a response of him or prayer. And then 137, in contrast, is a lament during Israel's exile in Babylon, when singing praise songs was most difficult. Notice that verse 8 says, daughter of Babylon, and not just Babylon. So we should be careful not to always think the word daughter means someone else, as many do when studying prophecy. Just to make this point in Psalm 137 that daughter of Babylon can remain, can indeed refer to actual Babylon herself. 138 is a praise from David for God's deliverance, blessings, and empowerment. And in 139, the praise is for God's omniscience, his all-knowingness, his omnipresence, being everywhere. There's no place to go to hide from him and his superiority in every way. Verse 15 is proof that our spirits exist before we're born. So it's a strong rebuttal to abortion. Yet verse 16 is often taken out of context to teach that we have no free will. But what it actually says is that the number of our days is predetermined, not whether we'll spend eternity with God. It's not our salvation, it's our lifespan. That's all it's saying there in verse 16. But what about verses 21 and 22, where David expresses absolute hatred for those who hate God? We know from John 3.16 that God loves the whole world, and from Ezekiel 18.32 that God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, and from 2 Peter 3.9 that God doesn't want anyone to be destroyed. Yet we also know that God himself will punish the wicked themselves, not just their deeds, per Matthew 25, 46 and Revelation 14, 11. But God's punishment is not out of hatred, but holiness. So was David wrong to hate? Notice that he follows that thought with the, the last verses there, with a plea for God to examine his heart and to lead him in the right way. Could it be that he knew it was wrong to hate? This seems, at least to me, to be a better solution than the other than the clear expression of hatred doesn't mean what it says. That's what many commentators say. They say, well, he doesn't mean he hates the people. 
But that's not what it says. It's very clearly hating the people. But again, it's followed by him saying, examine me. See if there's anything wrong and teach me the right way. The last two verses are often prayed by Christians today, but we need to make sure we really mean those words. So I think given all things in consideration about the nature of God and his holiness and his love, that he brought Jesus, that Jesus came so that all the world could be saved and he doesn't want anyone to suffer, etc. That again, God's punishment is never out of hatred. It's out of justice and love for the victims. So we can say that if David hated the people, which it seems to be expressing, then maybe he was saying, help me out here. I think that's as good a solution as any of the other ones saying that hate doesn't mean hate. So then let's go to Psalm 140. It's yet another plea for deliverance. And verse 3, by the way, is quoted in Romans 3.13. Psalm 141 continues with that theme, as does 142 and 143. You can read through those. 144 continues also, and verse 3 is quoted by Hebrews 2.6. Then it turns to confident hope, which continues on into Psalm 145. And then 146 reminds us that we only overcome evil by God's power. And 147 praises God for his wisdom and provision, while 148 invites all of creation to join in the praise. Notice that verse 4, was, which was written, of course, well after the flood, still refers to waters above the sky. Make of that what you will. 149 is a praise of victory for Israel. And finally, Psalm 150 is nothing but praise in the most energetic and loud terms. Every sentence starts with praise. Instruments, voices, loud clinging cymbals, everything that has breath. So it's saying, you know, everything in nature is to praise God. And this is the way we'll end our study of the Psalms, since that's the last one. And hopefully this bird's eye view will provide a perspective that's often missed because even though a lot of the Psalms explain themselves in the original text, these aren't always put in the translations. So I can't assume everyone is reading the same versions I am and, and has these things included. So that's it for the Psalms. Next time, of course, we'll go on to the Proverbs.